Okay, well, thank you, uh, Johanna, for the invitation to speak, and uh, I look forward to a, to a nice uh, week in, in Bridgeport. Um, I guess I should apologize. I'm not going to talk about holography directly at all um, today. I'm going to instead talk about entanglement. And, uh, well, there, of course, there are some relationships, uh, particularly in the context of churn simons theory. Um, so this is, this, what I'm going to tell you is, is actually two, is about two separate projects um, that we've been carrying out for a number of years. Um, some of my, oops, some of my collaborators are, are listed here. Um, one of the collaborations is with uh, Taylor Hughes, who's a condensed matter theorist at Urbana, and many of you know Vijay um, at Penn. Okay, so um, it's, it's a very basic interest to understand um, entangle entanglement and the patterns of entanglement in any quantum theory, but especially in, in quantum field theories. For example, in gauge gravity duality, it's expected that entanglement plays a central role um, in the inner workings of holography and the emergence of bulk spacetimes and things like that. And in condensed matter physics, it's also a very primary tool these days, um, especially in the study of topological states of matter. And just as an advertisement, um, one thing that has emerged in the last couple of years um, is the use of entanglement inequalities, such as positivity or monotonicity, relative entropy in addition to um, ordinary entanglement en entropies. They play a powerful role in constraining quantum field theories. Um, for example, we were able to establish um, null energy conditions, the average null energy condition in the first paper, and Faulkner and collaborators extended this to, um, to the local case, to the quantum null energy condition. So these are, these are powerful ideas, and um, we're interested in particular in studying, studying these concepts in topological field theories because these field theories are much, are much simpler. And in the case of 3D Chern-Simons, they are um, very well understood, okay? And so we have a big toolbox to explore things. Okay, so because this is the first talk on entanglement, let me just um, give you one slide on, on the basics. Okay, often in quantum field theory, we're interested in talking about spatial entanglement. Okay, so the idea is, is that um, if, it, if it's true that the Hilbert space can be thought of as a direct product of sub-Hilbert spaces that are localized on regions in space, then we can think about tracing over sub-regions, spatial sub-regions, given a particular state of the theory. And that tracing gives rise to a reduced density matrix that has... Um, well, that, that one can study, and in particular, one defines the entanglement entropies, the trace of row log rho, the von Neumann entropy of that density matrix. And there are associated quantities known as Renyi entropies um, that, that are trace of rho to the n in the, in the residual Hilbert space that you obtain after tracing. Okay, so those are, those are basic um, observables. You're, and as I mentioned, there are other more elaborate quantities like relative entropy, but I won't, uh, I won't um, talk about those today. So that picture is very simple um, in, the, in the cases where it actually makes sense. Um, for example, in, in simple field theories of scalars and spinner fields, it's really true that the degrees of freedom are in some sense local spatially. But in gauge theories, this, of course, doesn't, um, doesn't happen at all. The Hilbert space doesn't factorize the way I just described. And the reason is, of course, is that the observables are ge generically not local. They're loops, for example, Wilson loops. And if we imagined trying to cut the system spatially, well, you can imagine that we would have degrees of freedom that straddle the entanglement cut. And so, um, and so it's not a clean separation of the degrees of freedom in that sense. 
Okay? And what this is pointing to is the fact that if one considers cutting open space in this way in gauge theories, then there really are degrees of freedom that will emerge on the edges of the regions. Okay? And in, in 3D Chern-Simons theories in particular, this is actually <coughs> very familiar. Okay? In that case, the bulk theory, the theory in three dimensions is topological. And one, when one cuts it open, one sees that there's one plus one dimensional physics on that, uh, on, on any surface. And that's, um, well, at low energies at least, it's given by a, typically by a wesemino witten um, conformal field theory. Okay, so, so part of what I want to do today is I want to, well, in one of the projects, I want to sort of focus on these edge modes, the physics of these edge modes. And I'll show you a, a detailed computation where these things play a central role. Okay, but let me, let me first just to expand on, on this a little bit in the case of 3D churn Simons. Um, the non-factorizability of the Hilbert space, is spatial non-factorizability, is um, very easy to understand. If you think about um, doing the path integral of churn Simons theory on a three-manifold, okay, I'm just going to work in Euclidean geometries here, that at least locally you can think of as R cross a Riemann surface, for example, okay, then that, that path integral can be thought of as computing the wave functional of a, of a state, say the ground state of some other state. Okay, so you can think about it as R cross sigma or you could think about it as the Riemann surface filled in to um, form a three geometry with boundary, the boundary being sigma. And because that has the, the path integral has an interpretation as a, as a wave functional, we can associate a Hilbert space, say H sub sigma, um, to that, to any given Riemann surface. Okay, and you can, and one can explore other non, one can explore the states in that, in that Hilbert space, they correspond to introducing non-trivial Wilson loops in the, in the 3D space time. On the other hand, if, if you take a, as I was just mentioning, if you take a, a um, two-dimensional space that has a boundary, then there are, then the Hilbert space is actually bigger because there are West Amino Witten degrees of freedom that live on the boundary. Okay, so if you, so the simplest example of the non-factorizability that I was talking about is just obtained by thinking about taking a, a two-sphere as space and splitting it up into two disks that are glued together. And in Chern Simon's theory, the, the dimension of the Hilbert space on a two sphere is one dimensional. It's because all of the Wilson loops are contractible in that case. But the dimension of the Hilbert space on, on the disk um, is not one. In fact, it's very large generically, it depends on the level of the Chern Simon's theory. Okay, so at best, what you can say is that the Hilbert space on S2 is, in fact, a subspace of the of the Hilbert space on the two on the two factors. Okay, it doesn't it doesn't factorize into this product. It's only it's only contained. In it. Okay, and it's through this mechanism that entanglement um, actually knows about the edge modes. Okay, so so um, an old story is the study of bipartite entanglement, so it's very much like the setup that I was just describing where you're trying to split the system into, into two regions spatially. Okay, and what one, um, what one finds is even though there are these problems with the splitting of the Hilbert space, one can nevertheless go ahead and compute entanglement entropy. Okay, and I'll describe how that's done in a second. But one can compute the entanglement entropy and you find, in fact, that the answer, well, there's a, in general, you'd expect that there's a, a linear divergence, but there's a topological finite contribution to the entanglement entropy that's determined by um, the data of the dual West Amino witten CFT. And it's principally the modular S matrix that comes in, things like quantum dimensions, et cetera. Okay. And the results depend on 
Um, well, they depend on the topology of the space, okay, so the, the details of which Riemann surface you're considering. It depends on the topology of how you cut that into two pieces, okay, and it also depends on the details of which pure state you take the entanglement in. And um, I don't know, about 10 years ago, we computed this in, in essentially a generic situation where, as I said, the boundary is a single Riemann surface. And it turns out that you can use what's called the replica trick. Basically, you compute Brenyi entropies and, and evaluate the entanglement entropy as a limit. You can, you can, you can do that computation um, using surgery methods. Okay, and the nice thing about this, the nice, the nice thing about that computation was that in fact it bypasses this issue with the non-factorizability of, um, of the Hilbert space and basically it's because the, any of the Renyu entropies is a, is a path integral on a, on a three geometry without boundaries at the end of the day. So as I said, I'm gonna tell you about two different projects which you can think of as extensions of these ideas. The first one um, concerns a general program where we would like to study multipartite notions of entanglement. And in, in simple quantum systems like qubits, there's, there, are a few, you know, there are things known about multipartite entanglement, but very little is known in the, in the context of quantum field theory. Okay, so again, Looking at topological field theories is a place where perhaps we can learn something. Okay, so um, what we looked at is a, is a generalization of that previous story where we take the boundary of the three geometry now to have multi multiple components. Okay, and one way to think about that is to take a, a 3D space time, which is a link complement. Let me just skip ahead and explain what I mean by that. Okay, so a link, what I mean by an n component link is an embedding of n circles, which in general can be linked together in some complicated way. Okay, if there was a, if there, if there was a single circle, this would be a knot, a generic knot, and in the, in the n component case, um, it's an n component link. Okay, and the idea is, is that if you take that link and draw a tubular neighborhood around it, in other words, you fatten, fatten it out into a collection of tori, then the link complement is just defined by taking, say, the full space, which we'll, for simplicity we'll take to be a three-sphere, and cutting out that neighborhood of the link. Okay, so that's a three-manifold with, with n boundaries that are, that are topologically linked together. And if you do the, if you do the Chern-Simons path integral on that geometry, as I said before, it generates for you a state or a wave functional in general, okay, which we refer to as a link state. Okay? And because we fatten these out into tori, you can think about this as being in a tensor product of the torus-Hilbert space. Okay? And so one can study, one, one can study entanglement in this, in this case by tracing over some subset of these Hilbert spaces. Okay, so I'm doing something different than what, what I described in the bipartite case. In the bipartite case, what I was doing was cutting, the, you know, the, the entire space was a single Riemann surface and I was cutting that Riemann surface into pieces. Here what I'm doing is some, something simpler, which is that I'm tracing over entire um, entire tori. Okay, let me just go back and see if I... Okay, now the interesting thing about this, about this is that, so, so I've set up here um, a situation where I have multiple boundaries, and by tracing in this way, the idea is, is that I'm gonna get information about multipartite entanglement. Yeah. So in this case, there's not a problem because, as I was trying to say, in this case, what I'm doing is I'm is I'm tracing over 
over the entire Hilbert space, okay, over, over one of the factors or two of the factors, some subset of the, of the factors here, okay? So the, the tori that I have here, I'm not cutting them up. I'm just, I'm tracing over those whole Hilbert spaces, okay? In the bipartite case, that was, that was not the case, that's right. And I'll come back to that later in the talk. But um, the thing that I mumbled about was in the way that we computed it, it's conceptually a problem, but the calculation uses surgery where you're, you know, say a Renyi entropy is, is a Chern-Simons path integral on a, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a Chern-Simons path integral on a manifold without boundary, okay? So that path integral is, um, exists without, without a problem. The surgery methods um, can, be, can be used to reduce it to a, to a known result, okay? But in the, in the, in the second application I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you about, you'll see much more about these, about the edge modes. I don't, I'm not trying to sweep it under the rug. I'm just saying that it wasn't, it turned out not to be a, it, it turned out not to be, 10 years ago we didn't have to understand what was going on, okay? Okay, so in fact, when one sets things up in this way, one finds that entanglement entropy is in fact a Lincoln variant of a particular, you know, a particular structure. And in fact, it's, it's sort of special in the sense that it's, well, this is a technical issue, but it's, a, it's framing independent. And in the case of abelian churn simons theories, we were able to completely understand um, the entanglement entropy for, for completely general links. And what happens is, is that the abelian theories um, don't know much, in fact, they only, they only uh, sense the Gauss linking, sort of the, the number of times that the uh, components of the link um, are linked together. But in non-abelian theories, the structure is um, more elaborate, and um, in, but on the other hand, it's much more complicated to compute. And in the non-abelian case, we just sort of work on a case-by-case -case basis. But we have managed to look at um, SU2 level K and as well, we, we spent a lot of time looking at um, SL2C with, an, with the idea that this is perhaps related to 3D Euclidean gravity. Okay, so I won't go, I won't go into details, but there's, um, if you look, for example, at three component links, you can identify <coughs> properties that are familiar from um, three qubit systems. Okay, so multipartite notions like well, there's a classification in that case into GH, what are called GHZ and W-like um, states. And one finds that broad classes of, of link states behave as if they were either GHZ or W. Okay, okay to, to cut to the chase, um, it's interesting here that, at least for these um, for sufficiently complicated Chern-Simons theories, that there's sort of a tracking between topological entanglement that's involved in defining the states that we're talking about and the quantum entanglement. Okay, so let me change gears now and go on to the second sort of application. And as I was discussing with Julian, um, one, of, one of our motivations here is to, would, is to understand the role of the edge modes um, more directly. Okay, and so the setup is as follows. So we're, what we're going to consider um, is a situation where we have two Chern-Simons theories, okay, in, in some, say, regions of space, and we're gonna bring them together, okay, along, along a shared interface, which generically will take to be one plus one dimensional. Okay, so in this, in this picture and in the pictures on the next few transparencies, I'm, I'm suppressing, um, I'm drawing space here, I'm suppressing time. Okay, and, well, okay, so let's think about the physics of this a little bit. If, if these regions were separated, then we have 
separated Chern-Simons theories that have boundaries. And generically, then, there are chiral edge modes that propagate in one plus one dimensions. Those are the West amino witten theories that I was talking about. Okay, and if I bring these together, if I bring them together, then, well, as they become close together, those edge modes start to interact with one another, at least generically. Okay. And it can happen, well, okay, so what happens depends on the details of those, of those interactions. But a simple thing that can happen under certain conditions is that the edge modes actually gap out. Okay. And in the continuum, from the point of view of the Chern-Simons theory, um, you can think about these gapping interactions, which are interactions amongst the edge modes themselves. It turns out that those are related to interface conditions on the gauge fields on either side of the, of the interface. Okay. And it turns out that um, one can consider well, okay, so I'll call these interface conditions, but um, one way to think about the system, at least if the two spaces on either side are homeomorphic, is that you could think about, you could think about folding um, the right over onto the left, and in that, from that point of view, you would have a larger Chern-Simons theory, um, but in a system with a boundary, okay? So the topological interface conditions from left to right, or right, red to blue, that I'm talking about here, from that point of view, can be thought about as topological boundary conditions. Yep. This wouldn't happen. That's right. So I'm, so in fact, what I want to do here is I want to consider systems where the, where the uh, edge modes are completely gapped out, okay? The gen you're right, that the generic situation would be that, if I go back, the generic situation would be that there's some generally chiral system there, but it could have both left and right movers in, in both cases. It could happen that way, okay? And then when I put them together, there would be some sub subset of the system that maybe is gapped out, but there might be some massless stuff left over. And exactly how that happens, I'll give you a few de details in a moment, but exactly how that happens depends on the details of these interface conditions that I'm getting. Okay, now, good. So as I was saying, I want to consider the case where the, the edge modes that would have been there had these things been separated are actually gapped out. And, but, one of the reasons that this is interesting from the entanglement point of view is that even though, even though those edge modes are gapped, the system, the entanglement of the system remembers their presence in a sense. In particular, if you put the entanglement cut directly along the interface between the two regions, then there's sort of an anomalous contribution to the entanglement to the entanglement entropy, for example. Okay, well, whether you find that surprising or not, it doesn't really matter, but um, initially that, um, that was surprising to us because, you know, it do, it's, sort of, it's sort of there, it's, if you like, it's sort of a topological remnant, and it doesn't matter how massive the, uh, the interface modes have been made. Oh my goodness, okay. I started really late, I don't remember. Um, okay, so, so just to get down to uh, brass tacks, the simplest example to consider is a case where you just have abelian theories on both sides. Suppose they're bo they are both U1 to the N, okay? So the Chern-Simons model on the left or the right looks like this, where there's a K matrix here. And the simplest thing that you can do is to make the two Chern-Simons um, systems distinct by assigning different K matrices on the left and the right. Okay, and as I mentioned, in addition to those bulk terms, you should supply a boundary action whose variation determines, determines the, um, the interface conditions on the gauge fields between the two regions. 
Okay, and as I was as I was also saying, that action that bound, that interface action can be taken to be topological. In other words, you can you don't need it doesn't need to depend on a choice of metric or complex structure on the interface. Okay, and these interface conditions or boundary conditions were studied um, a while a while ago, and in fact they've been classified. Okay, so they're fairly well understood. And as I said, a choice of such a boundary action or consequently the boundary conditions, the interface conditions, um, corresponds to the details of the gapping interactions from the point of view of the interface modes. Okay, well, generically, if you think about Wilson, line, Wilson loops in the system, generic Wilson lines well, in the, on the left, well, there are loops that, you know, that just stay within the region, but there are also Wilson lines now that can end, that may be able to end on the, on the interface. And what the interface conditions are telling you is which linear combinations of the gauge fields can, you know, follow a Wilson line across the interface. And so generically in this particular theory, what you find is that there are some global U1 charges that you can think about as the ends of these Wilson lines here. And then there's, there, there are gauge fields that can go through. Okay, so this is the way in this system that the edge modes um, occur. And, um, okay, well not too many details here, but one can specify <coughs> the particular linear combinations by giving a pair of vectors that I'll call V left and V right here. And what one finds is that there's an, what we call an effective K matrix, okay, that determines the entanglement, okay? And it, it turns out that it's given by um, the inner product of these gapping vectors with the original um, K matrices. And again, as, as Schumann was asking, there's an assumption here, remember, that we're gapping everything. And so the rank, in particular the condition, what, a simple condition is that the rank of K left should match the rank of K right. Okay, so one way to proceed with, I told you the answer, but one way to proceed with these calculations is to use the replica trick. And in these pictures, what I'm, I'm suppressing now is spatial dimension. Okay, and so Euclidean time is, is running upwards here. And on the left, I'm giving you a cartoon of the reduced density matrix where I have, where I have the entanglement cut along the, uh, along the interface between the two regions. And I'm tracing here over what I'm calling now the, the uh, right modes. Okay, so this is the density matrix, and the, the en Renyi entropy is, is gotten by gluing these things to, together n times sequ sequentially. Okay, so for example, here's a picture of trace rho squared. Okay, and one of the things that I've done in this picture is that I've cut out a region around the entanglement cut. Okay, and you can think about that as an ultraviolet cutoff in the system. And um, it's very important, particularly in this context, that you keep that, that you keep that finite as you do the calculations. Two minutes. Two minutes? I think I'm almost done. Okay, so you can, so you can visualize this in several ways. One of the, um, one of the sort of exotic things about this computation is that if you, you know, you can think about computing entanglement entropy and these Renyi entropies using surgery methods again, but the, uh, but the, 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 the three manifolds that you're doing the Chern-Simons path integral on now are in a sense striped, okay? Because there are, reason, there are regions that are red and there are regions that are blue, okay? And so in order to do that path integral, you have to think carefully about how to do it. And you can, you can visualize this in several ways. Okay, I won't go into the details, um, of how you do this, but if you sort of think about folding things over, you can recast the system, in, in fact, as a, this is for trace row to the n, you can think about this as, as an effective 
Chern-Simons theory with a K matrix given precisely by this K effective, but on an N replicated manifold. That's what I'm trying to represent here. Okay, and the UV cutoff in these pictures is literally the size of these pori. Okay, if I had sent the UV cutoff to zero, then these would have degenerated and you would have lost a lot of the physics. And it's interesting that another way to think about this is, so this is, if you like, sort of a closed string picture. You can also think about this as a transition amplitude between boundary states. And the nature of the boundary states actually emerge by thinking about the physics of the edge modes. Okay, and that comes about um, as follows. In fact, they are, these, these boundary states that I'm referring to are precisely Ishibashi states. And um, one way to think about this is from the point of view of an ex extended Hilbert space picture. Okay, so I mentioned that, so let me just go back to a sort of a simpler story where we refer to the sphere cut into two disks. Okay, so one can, one can think about the, an extended Hilbert space picture where we embed these, this Hilbert space in a bigger, in a bigger Hilbert space that includes the physics of the edge modes. And so here's some of the details. Um, if you take a disk, then you can cast the gauge transformations in terms of the West Amino current, the modes of the currents. Okay, here's the left and the right. And choosing, choosing a, a, an interface condition corresponds to making some identification between the coefficients here. And the, the um, generator of gauge transformations in the product space then has this form. Okay, and so if I require that my state is gauge invariant, in other words, it's annihilated by this operator, that in fact looks precisely like an Ishibashi condition. Okay, so this is how um, these states, these, this Ishibashi interpretation emerges. Okay, and if I, if I consider entanglement now, tracing over, say, one disk in this simplified picture corresponds to tracing over the West amino oscillator modes, okay? And so following this extended Hilbert space mechanism, one finds in fact that the subregion entanglement in chern simons is directly related to left-right entanglement in, in the Ishibashi state. So this is something that people independently studied, but here we see that they're related directly, at least in the regulated theory. Okay. So yeah, I'm, I'm just finishing. Okay, so when we apply these ideas to, the, to this heterogeneous example, which is more elaborate, you can, call, you can follow the details and it reproduces the entanglement entropy that I, that I quoted. Okay, just in time, let me just, um, let me just summarize by um, reiterating that study of topological field theories in the context of entanglement um, is of interest in developing ideas. And one of the things that we would like to pursue is to formulate um, further multipartite notions. Okay, so let me stop there. Okay, thanks a lot, Rob, for your very nice talk. So, is there one or two quick questions? Uh, Marika? So, the quantum information community has explored other managers of multipartite entanglements as well as entanglement entropy. So, things like the tangle. Um, can you comment on um, how the tangle, um, the three tangle, could be used in this situation? Have people explored it? Um, no, I don't have much to say. Um, we've just sort of begun to trying to compare it to existing beyond, you know, beyond. So, uh, 
Could I interpret then that if you have this kind of boundary where you actually have a gapped state, so meaning when you have an overlap that you showed nicely, then you have some kind of singularity or some kind of discontinuity in Witcher Simon's terms? Could I just generalize it? Does it depend on the symmetry class? So, so you are showing this kind of uh, edge states. And how, do, how can we see this in the Charles Simon's terms? So the question is, do I see always this continuity, if, uh, independent of the symmetric class? Because there are, can be edge states coming from different symmetric classes. Maybe we can discuss later. Is it necessary for the interaction to be uh, irrelevant the, between the, interaction to be what? the interactions between the two halves of the system when, when, when you glue them, when you bring them together? Yes. Do you need the interaction to be irrelevant? Irrelevant? irrelevant. irrelevant. Well, you, you, you need... In the continuum, yeah. you think about the interactions that I'm talking about. I mean, the dominant things are actually masters. Yes. Okay, so the, if you think about the edges yeah. and uh, say free bosons, what we're doing is inducing masses. So definitely relevant. 